Hello everyone to this last um, meeting in this year of the CEO Working Group. Um, I'm not showing any specific, uh, special slides today because you all know how this works, not well applied, etc. Um, let's start with the agenda. Um, if some people come late, um, they'll still see that we we'll kind of we, agenda will take us a few minutes, a, a minute or so anyway. Um, for today, we have the shepherding of the drafts that recently passed working group last call. Um, the next steps for the common deterministic encoding, and then a block on CDDL 2.0, um, where Carsten has slides for, which Carsten has slides for. Um, on the topic of um, CBOR use and other STOs, um, some one very recent recent um, Carsten added that there is something about CBOR LD. So we'll talk briefly about that as well. And yes, that's what's on the agenda now. Any additions to that, changes that we should make um, in terms of shuffling or what is in there? Um, hearing none, I'll go ahead with the status of the uh, updates to the grammar of CDDL and the new grammar of um, that CBOR diagnostic notation. Uh, those have passed working group last call um, after IDF 118. We've um, exchanged a few mails and I will be shepherding those and I've already started um, reviewing them for shepherd review. And unless something comes up there, which I don't expect to, um, we'll have a... Um, uh, no, I'm, I, don't, I don't have slides for that. So I'm just um, working, off the, uh, working off the notes. And Actually, I have slides for that. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, then um, I'll just pull them up and yeah, pull that. Da, 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 da. Yik. Okay. Um, so there is. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Thanks. Um, and with that, they'll get their Shepherd review and should be on their way. I can't promise that this will be done this year, but. Um, they're not too long, so shouldn't take too yeah, long. We, we have a pretty interesting bubble in front of a bottleneck at the RFC editor. So lots of stuff that should be published now is sitting in the RFC editor queue. <clears throat> so that, that will be interesting after we have completed uh, the process. Um, yeah, but I, I would suppose that even with even if the shepherd if I managed to complete the shepherd write up this year, um, IESG review and etc would take some time until this takes his RC editor anyway. So let's see, sure. let's see how that works out. Yep. Um, on the CDE um, side, um, Carsten, you already have presentation right, so please continue there. Yeah. So uh, my. Um... Um, perception is that uh, we we are pretty sure that we want to do this and we want to do this uh, without uh, spending another year or so on it. Uh, and the, the document should be useful for this. Um, I think we, we need to uh, put some attention to detail in there. And so far, the only place where we have found a need for that um, is NAN payloads, not a number of payloads, um, but I'm not entirely sure that's really the only one. So um, it, it would be um, interesting um, to, to hear from, from other implementers, but on the subject of NAN payloads, uh, the problem really is that uh, this is a pretty dusty corner of IEEE 754. And uh, the interoperability specifications in 754 are, well, yeah, pre pretty full of holes, um, in particular because implementations of NAN payloads actually have diverged in the past. And, and IEEE was not uh, strong enough to simply say, OK, that, that old implementation and that chip that, that you can't even buy anymore that that is now non-conforming because we are agreeing on something. So we have to do a little bit of, of IEEE's work here, which is not exactly what you would want to do, but, but in, in the given situation, 
that, that may be quite appropriate because really people haven't implemented it because it's so incredibly hard to, to find useful information about it. And so the role of the CDE document could be to add a little bit of guidance uh, here, what uh, an implementer of a generic uh, CBA encoder decoder should do. Um, but even with that, uh, I think it's, it's uh, fair to assume that many won't implement even basic support for NAN payload. So uh, the, with, with that uh, whole uh, limitation in, in the, the full compliance to the specification, however you want to uh, call it, uh, it's... Um, probably not a problem to write up the, the deterministic encoding for that anyway, uh, because, uh, uh, well, if people want to do it, then they can do it right right away. So uh, we actually help uh, implementers here. We don't, not, are not putting any undue concern on that. That's probably language that, that we uh, need to, to put in there that, that says, um, okay, we know that NAND payloads are, are a dusty corner and uh, we, we don't necessarily expect people to implement this on the occasion of implementing CDE, but if you want to do it, here's some information on, on how to do that. Could, could you maybe say one or two words on what the, what the issue with NAND payloads is? I mean, I've, I've hadn't had my fingers in that corner of floats for quite some time. Um, my understanding is that NAN payloads are essentially like there is a NAN flagged by some things, in, I think, in, in the in the exponent. And then the Mantissa is kind of free for all, and it doesn't have any equivalences anyway, because there's only partial equality defined on floats in the first place, and any NAN is unequal to any other NAN anyway. Correct. What, what so what do those non-conforming implementations do that we would, um, where we would be doing IEEE's job? Well, one, one issue with NANs is that the, the bit uh, that actually tells you whether uh, the NAN is quiet or signaling um, is defined. Uh, we know where that bit is, but we don't know which values mean what. Um, since that was an interoperability problem, everybody has essentially agreed on on a particular uh, meaning of that bit, uh, which of course I, I forget. I think uh, the bit set is quiet and the bit not set is, is signaling. I, I don't remember, but th there, there is now a, a common way of doing this and we actually make a reference to that in the uh, preferred, preferred encoding discussion in 8949. So, since it's typically not particularly helpful to, to send a signaling uh, NAN, um, we, um, I mean, you, you can send it, but uh, people will not be able to do a lot with it because it will immediately signal. Um, you typically are interested in, in interoperability on the quiet uh, uh, NANs. Um, and the, the other thing that um, the preferred encoding does is it actually does um, request you to uh, use the most compact uh, form. So you would use the float 16 for, for a NAN, in particular for the, the quiet NAN that everybody implements. It's probably a good idea to, to have a common form and, and not have the three lengths um, for them. But that, of course, means that you would have to define uh, which long NAN payloads can be um, abbreviated with which uh, shorter um, payloads. And uh, that, that is, again, something that 754 is not explicit about. On the other hand, it's pretty obvious what you want to do. You want to do exactly the same thing that you're doing, doing for non-NANs. Um, so you essentially check whether the rightmost bits are zero. And if the rightmost bits are zero, then, then you can use the more compact uh, representation by, by, by uh, eliding those rightmost bits. So a non-payload non is essentially a, a sequence of binary digits that is after the <clears throat> binary decimal point 
um, with, uh, so it, it uh, truncates from the right, not from the left as, as integers usually uh, would do. But that, that's already true of, of other floating point numbers uh, as well, of course. Okay, thanks. I don't know yet what kind of, I don't have an opinion based on that yet, but at least I know what to think about. Well, I actually have to do a little bit of archaeology and, and look at my implementations, how they actually handle uh, this. Uh, I would expect they already handle this the, the way I have just described, but I have to look it up and maybe fix um, uh, some of uh, those. And I might learn something from, from the fixes, but I think that's the, the one remaining thing we, we should simply specify and um, even if 754 doesn't give us a lot of guidance, uh, they are the, the, the actual implementations too. As a point of curiosity to judge, to kind of to, to make something of the silence that I hear around this otherwise, <laughs> um could i get a brief maybe show of hands of who has ever worked with floats no matter whether nans or not uh, in seabor in the first place of those around Okay, so I, 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 I will, I will, I will, I, I will mark, I will mark in for for later review that, uh, for late for kind of for the later summaries that this is indeed a niche topic. <laughs> yes. And and uh, Michael's chat comment I think is is pretty important uh, that uh, we have to make sure that we don't uh, build in a trap here for uh, people who who. Um, actually aren't interested in the floating point stuff at all, but uh, have to deal with potentially malicious senders that uh, put a NAN into a payload, making the implementation explode at the wrong time in the wrong place. And uh, we, we have to uh, make sure that doesn't happen. But that, that's, that's actually a bug in Cibor and not, not a bug in, in CDE. So, so it's actually probably okay if the Cibor library has no support for floats at all. Right, you've compiled it out completely, right? So you receive this thing, yes. just an unknown. The place where it's dangerous is where the library has support for floats and we weren't using them. Uh, so you didn't test them. And then you get some, yeah, something in there and you try to print it and whatever, right? Yeah, two, two or three years ago, I probably would have completely agreed with you uh, with the, the increased attention for floating point uh, processing in, in uh, machine learning models. I think that is changing and we are going to see more of this floating point stuff in the constraint environment as well. Um, so I think we need to pay additional attention and I still have this, this draft that actually looks at uh, modern uh, machine learning encodings for floating point numbers. There are a few more that we probably need to support in arrays, right? Posits, for instance, and uh, yeah, that, that's on my program for 2024. But there, there are also eight-bit uh, floating point values and, and other interesting things that machine learning people are using, and, and uh, we probably should put in support. Okay, I think that, that, that was some, some useful guidance in, in how to develop this. So it, it is okay to have some of this discussion in the CDE document, even though it's not, not a core CDE issue, but uh, it, it's a 
convenient place to put some discussion uh, in that, that will also be helpful to the CDE people. Okay, thanks. Um, I think with that we can go on to CDDL. <coughs> okay, so we, we have four documents about uh, CDDL in the pipeline right now. Two we already discussed. So the, the CDDL grammar fix and, and uh, literals uh, document. Um, so the, the next one that we should uh, probably wrap up is the more control. Uh, document. So um, the, the, much of what this round of adding control operators to uh, CDL is about is uh, doing more for supporting both JSON and CBOR as the, the target representations in a single specification. So we have a lot of things that, that convert between text and binary, so we have base 64 support and, and things like that. Uh, so you can all do all this without adding tons of comments and, and tons of, of uh, ad hoc uh, code. Um, it turns out that uh, th there are, of course, other representation uh, techniques here. For instance, uh, a number could be represented by, by a decimal. Uh, representation we, we already have that in there and uh, now we have the first example where somebody wants to have a hex uh, representation and instead of uh, adding half a dozen more control operators with all the formatting support they actually want fixed four digit text numbers um, with zero x in front um, I decided that it probably would be a good idea to simply add printf to, to <laughs> CDDL, um, which uh, of course is uh, a pretty big thing and we probably need to specify down a little bit to what we actually expect to uh, support. So that, that uh, I expect to, to have another round on, on this document where the printf support is specified to more uh, detail. Um, the question is, uh, is there anything else that we should support in this round? And for that, of course, it would be interesting to see what, what CDDL are we using. Um, th there are almost a hundred IETF documents that now have CDDL in them. So um, it, it is getting a bit tedious to, to um, actually check all of them and see which, which could get uh, which would benefit from more CDL support. So getting input from the people who actually use this uh, would be the most useful way to, to move this forward. And I'm wondering how we actually can, can solicit that. Of course, CDL users are in the IETF and also outside the IETF. Um, so we, we would have to find a way to, to reach out, as they say, um, to the, the outside IETF communities as well. So I have some some uh, pretty good input from TCG, which is also where the sprintf stuff came uh, from. And um, yeah, if we have channels for other people who are using CDL, we should try to use them to, to uh, put a lid on, on this document. Of course, we can always do another one uh, later on. Uh, but doing them every three years or so is, is probably a reasonable uh, rhythm. I'm just wondering if it make, makes sense to contact work, IT, at least for within the ITF where it's hard enough to contact working groups that have used this extent, uh, that have used CDDL extensively. Maybe send a mail to say the, the four or five working groups because they are likely not to be subscribed to CBOR or read it, um, but their own lists uh, they might more easily read. That might get us some attention. 
Yeah, so we would uh, alert them to this thing and to the next slide as well. Um, that sounds like a good idea. Of course, what we also could do is, is have a kind of a CDDL focused interim for or interim segment uh, for for each of these working groups. Um, but maybe we should do the general call first and then see if they are interest interest. Good. So the Final one on the set of documents that we currently have for CDL20 is the modules um, document. Um, this is actually in use in some specifications. So, for instance, I, I copied a um, uh, number of lines out of the RADS UCCS um, document. Uh, where we want to say, hey, import the, the rest of the uh, rules from RFC 1952. And those people who already have an implementation of the module spec can do this with uh, semicolon hash mark, and the other ones will have to do this manually. Um, I don't want to put in a normative reference here because that means that UCCS, which already is, is, has been delayed, uh, a lot uh, would get more delay, so th this this should be finished uh, very very soon. So this is uh, kind of a, a hidden reference <laughs> to to the modules draft, and I would really like to to reduce the number of occasions where we have to to uh, do this. So this this should also be completed reasonably quickly, but we need feedback from users. So we, we have the same problem we have uh, for, for the previous slide, and uh, maybe we can combine the, the two uh, requests into one. So maybe this would be a good time for a poll who in this room has actually used the module stuff. Polls open now. Ouch. Yeah, which is not surprising to me because the the core people who are using uh, CDDL really are using it for constraint systems, and you often don't need this for constraint systems. You need this for more complicated stuff, like like the stuff done by. Uh, TCG or, or in the RADS uh, working group uh, and so on. Um, so th that's maybe part of our problem that, that the people who do the more complicated uh, work actually don't go to the CBO working group. In okay. which case, in which case, it might make sense to accompany the um, uh, to accompany that mail um, asking for input about those two uh, with an invitation to join a particular interim. Uh, if we if we want to designate one, so say say the last one before the next ITF, something mid February or so. Um, we can we can designate that interim now already, or by the time we send that email out. And and then gather a bit of a larger crowd for, for discussion on that. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, thanks, Ara. That's also a good pointer.
Okay, so we should have some some common meeting with uh, relevant global platform people very soon, I think. I yes, uh, the uh, three editors of uh, Client API, which is the universal API for connectors to any security component, specifically a TPM or a Mars from TCG or a. TEE or a trusted app inside of a TEE or a secure element. Um, that's the first of the core APIs. And it is also used by Entity Attestation Protocol API, which is a wire protocol using EATS that's vastly more mature than anything in ITF RATS. And the third is a universal key store that's completely operating system and application neutral um, and is undoubtedly going to get widespread use because of being promoted by the global platform TEE work group. So do we have access to those documents? They are all in public GitHubs and um, Jeremy O'Donohue from Qualcomm and uh, I can send you a direct email introducing you to the three chairs and editors. Great. Jeremy, of course, is quite active in RATS, but also in <clears throat> many other standards bodies, so he's busy. Yes. <laughs> but we were talking, Monday, we were talking about import slash include functionality and how really nice it would be <laughs> from their point of view to have it already published. Yep. <clears throat> oh, and relative to floats, about a year and a half ago, um, Jeremy and, and his whole larger group from TEE and TPS work groups uh, decided to hell with floats forever. We're not putting them into our libraries. Yeah, that, that sounds good to me. Um, they, they may come up in weird places. Um, the difficulty is them bleeding into core, like the internal API between TAs in um, a TEE, and they really don't want that because they are certain that there are then going to be um, implementation errors. Yep. Yeah, so there, there always needs to be some, some um, a uh, little Chinese wall that, that keeps the floating points that you actually need um, in, in an already represented right. form. So if you have a health certificate that, that your um, HbA1c is 6.5 uh, and somebody wants to send this as a floating point, then, then your uh, certification for uh, that, that certificate is not going to blow up just because there's a floating point number in there. Fortunately, there are CBOR uh, there are CBOR encoded binary string um, binary strings that contain CBOR for those cases. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> Good. So I'm done with the things that that are on the agenda. I have a seventh slide just for for a reminder there, there's something else on our plate and uh, <clears throat> we uh, need to continue getting um, input from from implementers and spec writers uh, as i said uh, we have input from the dns and seaboard people and so this this uh, is going on but uh, of course at some point we need to decide we are done with this and um, can can publish a first version and um, then start working on the next. 
Yeah, um, the, you have this nice word time box in there. Um, I'm, I think, I think we're stuck at the point where nobody is making a suggestion. So I'll just make a suggestion and wait, wait for the group to say, is I kind of do it, um, cut it earlier or cut it later. Um, so if I say, um, so I would go into these negotiations with, um, end of February, 2024. Um, does this sound good for you? So what, what exactly do you want to have in, in end of February, 2024? Um, a cut basically, basically a, um, a, a new feature cutoff. So, but by that time, it's like every, everything that is like if there are kind of we can still have editorial changes and um, and kind of um, fixed bugs and stuff. But end of end of February or whatever the time mm -hmm. would be, um, let's say that we don't um, we don't kind of push in new ideas unless unless there are really bugs to fix here. Okay. So we would do the working plus call at, at approximately that time. Yes. I mean, the second working plus call. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I think this should put us in a good position to have something that we can say that, that we're done with. Um, by by the next idea. Good. Great. That that was easier than I expected. Um, okay. Um, any anything more on that? Otherwise, you also have a point on on the CBLD. Um, at least added to the, to the to the agenda. So Ira's question is: Do we have a timeline for CDL 2.0? Sorry, I keep forgetting the chat. <clears throat> we. What I can say is we don't have a milestone for that. Yeah, what what exactly is that? Because the, the, there are several pieces in there. We don't have any milestones, so whatever that would be in the street. <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, I think we have these these pretty much independent two items: more control and modules. I mean, we we have to finish the other two documents as well, uh, but th that should be happening now. This is just procedural stuff. Uh, so uh, I would probably be happy with uh, having a, a freeze of those um, early next year as well. Don't know if this needs to be the same date. I think we are a little bit further along here, so it could be even earlier. Um, but uh, uh, doing some some time boxing here is probably useful as well. So this would be more control and modules. And of course, there, there is a, a third item, which I have been calling CDDL 2.5, because that really is, is adding something to the fundamental model, uh, which is about uh, annotations. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that there are lots of, of uh, applications where we want to have those uh, annotations. Um, but that's not something I would be able to put a timeline on yet. Next year. So one one piece uh, that that uh, we have been working on in another working group is the JSON path uh, specification. So the first thing we probably would want to do is uh, see how we can make JSON path. Uh, useful for CBO and and in CDDL, uh, so you already can use it for for any JSON uh, specification that, that uses CDDL. Uh, but we we have to to say how it, it would be interfacing to that, and we would have to extend JSON path with uh, CBO uh, uh, elements. So Ira also sees February as a good feature freeze for modules and more control. Sounds good to me.
Okay. So. Um, so um, that, that 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 communication is a good point to mention. Um, so Carsten, will you um, summarize the because the, the mail we talked about earlier um, belongs to those uh, to those two things? Um, will you will you send a mail out to the relevant working groups? I will do that. Oh, I will send it to you so this can come from a working group chair. Yes, thank you. Great, then we have a plan. Okay, so I still have this other thing I wanted to briefly yep. talk about. Okay, I can forward that mail to Global Platform and TCG, great. Um, I just wanted to, to point out that um, the the JSON ID people have finally noticed that people don't really want to use uh, JSON for applications that uh, either need uh, good encoding efficiency uh, uh, space wise or encoding efficiency time wise. Um, so uh, th they are looking at how to uh, introduce CBOR in their uh, applications. And by the way, they started out by putting in YAML. Uh, it's a, there's now a YAML LD um, spec, which is a community group spec at the moment. So it, it doesn't have official W3C recognition, but it might, might get some soon. Um, so th this points out that they really want to, to uh, um, spread out to, to other uh, representation formats than, than just JSON. And there already is a spec that is called CBOR LD, which essentially documents what one implementation did. And I'm, I'm using the term document pretty loosely because it's essentially, um, it's describing what the implementation does. <laughs> It doesn't provide any rational or, or high level view of, of what's going on there. Um, and so it's, it's essentially a variant of, of CBOR pack the, the way it, it's being defined uh, right now. And of course, we probably want to do a little bit more there um, because uh, JSON LD, of course, is RDF. And uh, maybe th there are better ways to, to get RDF represented uh, than going the, the detour over JSON-LD. Um, but of course, the JSON-LD people want, want uh, to somehow integrate that into the ecosystem. So there, there are a lot of non-technical aspects coming in here that, that I, I don't fully understand. Anyway, uh, that will come up. And one thing that is important to know is that CBOR LD document is just the description of an implementation and, and that's great. So it, it's certainly a basis uh, to look at, um, but it, it's not uh, a fully fleshed out uh, specification for, for a CBOR LD. Um, and uh, th there's also, well, RDF of course has, has lots of interesting encodings. And the, the question is uh, just 
like Jason LD is a good way to uh, represent RDF in, in JSON in a way that people that don't want to run the whole RDF machinery still can use some of the information. Um, that same thing might be applicable to, to CBOR. JSON LD now has this, this interesting mechanism, JSON LD 1.1, called framing, uh, which uh, controls how the RDF information is shaped into JSON. So you, you can, using this framing stuff, you can uh, make sure that, that uh, JSON LD is, is actually more useful than just as a tr transport format for something that you uh, turn back into RDF, have to turn back into RDF for processing anyway. Finally, so after like 10 years. <laughs> So um, I think we can discuss how, how useful this framing stuff is. I, I haven't actually worked with that uh, yet. But um, so th th there's lots of things going on there, uh, technical and non-technical. And I just wanted to point out things are going on. And it's not like this is a done deal, but it's something that we will be able to, to influence um if we want to and uh, so uh let, let's keep an eye on what's going on there so kind of personally having used um a lot of zebra and a lot of rdf um if this shaping is finally there that may make a lot of kind of i th i think that for for the use case where zebra is relevant it might be worth looking into whether there can whether um we can do something like shaped only um, uh, JSON Seabor uh, LD. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're using Seabor, you likely don't want to be explicit about the rules anyway. So can just as well provide the shape and the context all out of band always. And then we start getting into, a, then it starts, it can be interesting again because we have that shaping and that shaping might, if I'm kind of looking back to the annotations, might even provide an equivalence to something like seaboard based triples or whatever um, using some CDL transformation. And then it's the question of kind of which transformation language do you use? But if the encoded seaboard is equivalent to some RDF, well, that, uh, that, 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 that there might be something in there. And it can be kind of in it if it's useful in, in both directions and you can write your implementations with the shape. Uh, I, I, I should probably have a look at, at shape at, at, this, at that shaping here. Yeah, I think w one of the problems here is that uh, those transformations can be very lossy. And um, the, the, the JSON LD world is, is very much uh, under control of, of this entire pattern of, of uh, uh, shaping your design by the examples you come up with. Um, <clears throat> and uh, of course, you have to have examples when, when uh, uh, doing a design, but uh, if your focus becomes making these examples look good, um, even if you have no hope to actually get something as clean uh, in a real world application, then then you have a problem. And um, I, I would like to avoid uh, CYLD to to have the same problem. So it should be something that can be machine generated in a reasonable way. And uh, <clears throat> if you actually need to pack something, use something like Zebra Packed, um, but uh, don't, don't require some hidden semantics uh, buried in the compression mechanism, which is what curries really is. Um, OK, so be careful with those transformations, because they may be very lossy of things that people who work with JSON LD uh, find important. Thank you. That's it. That, that was a bunch of good pointers. Comments? Those interested in in, in, in kind of more, more 
Um, more comments might also want to look at the chat, but I think nothing was added there that is worth repeating here. Um, any other business that we should discuss today? Hearing none, uh, thank you, Marco, for um, writing most of the minutes. Um, have nice holidays and see you all again when the interims resume at some point next year, um, which the data track will tell you. Thanks. See you then. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks.